Hello, everybody. Anyone who's out there watching or listening stumbles across this. Welcome to my channel. My name is Ben. Uh, I am a classical studies major. I graduated, whatever. I got my degree here. Um, and I like swords. And I like swords. And I wanted to talk a little bit today to anyone who wanted to talk about swords about the differences between the Greek Xiphos, which was the short sword used by Greek hoplites in the classical period, uh, and the Roman gladius, which was used, well, in different forms uh, from the Roman Republic on through the later empire. It eventually gets replaced, but what replaces it isn't much different. Um, I hope my audio is all right, and I know my webcam isn't is an HD, but uh, eh, I got one viewer. Hello, one viewer. If we get more viewers, then uh, might be worth investing in some better equipment. But anyways, let's start this off. So we're going to start today talking about the Greek Zippos. Uh, this is the Devil's Edge Greek Zippos. Uh, I got this actually on sale. Uh, they said something was wrong with it. I have not figured out what. Um, as you can see, it's considered a short sword. Uh, I think the reason why is because if I hold it up to my arm, it doesn't go much past my uh, arm at the joint. Um, I think that this could be used as just a regular sword, but it's commonly referred to as a short sword. So let's look at some of the features of the Zippos. So if you notice right away, its most noticeable feature is this leaf-shaped blade, right? So what's a leaf-shaped blade? So you see how it starts down here uh, at the bottom really thin, and then it gets wider, and then it kind of tapers off back up here. So that's what uh, we call a leaf-shaped blade. Um, so the leaf-shaped blade in, in the archaeological record of the Mediterranean is it's one of the oldest types of swords that we actually find. Um, the most original, or uh, the, the earliest types um, may have only been ceremonial. Um, they were much shorter and the, their grips were much smaller. They were made out of bronze and these early forms were just one solid hunk of bronze, right? Uh, you can see here that this uh, model has a wooden handle that really improves how you're gonna be able to use it because you don't have to form the handle itself out of the bronze. Um, uh, and so the leaf-shaped blades were made out of bronze until iron replaced them. Um, and it sh I should note here that because uh, we're looking at modern recreations, uh, these blades are going to be made out of steel. So I, I didn't look up ahead of time uh, what type of steel, because there's different types of, of steel you can use to make swords. Um, but the point is, is that these would kick butt compared to their ancient predecessors. They're not really an accurate um, recreation in the sense of they're much more powerful. Uh, so what else do we have to say about the Zippos? So probably the, um, the second most important thing after you notice the leaf-shaped design of the Zippos is um, the knowledge that these actually weren't, uh, you know, primary weapons. Um, this wasn't the type of weapon that a Greek hoplite um, would rely on going into battle. Um, a Greek hoplite, their primary weapon was a spear between six and eight feet in length um, and their shield. Now, I have a little shield that I made here. It's not quite the same one that the Greeks would use, but it'll do for now. Um, it's important to notice... Oh, that when you're talking about swords and how they're used, it's a whole different game. I'm gonna make sure you can still hear me. It's a whole different game if you got your sword and your shield compared to if you just got your sword, right? If you just have a sword, you have to do all of your blocking, you know, parrying uh, with the sword. If you have a shield, you can just kind of focus on popping out from behind it, ah, ah, right? So that changes how Whew. changes how these swords were used. Um, the reason why uh, a Greek hoplite would even carry a sword into battle when they had their, sh their 
shield and spear would be if their spear broke or if they came into such close contact with the enemy that they were no longer able to use their spear. Um, right on. So with that, I'm going to introduce the Roman sword. Uh, this is a replica of the Mainz type gladius. The Mainz gladius was a sword found in Germany. All right, here we go. So let's take a look at this sword. Um, right away, it's it's a little bit heftier um, in terms of size. It, it's always looked a little cruder to me, but the Romans, you know, weren't weren't super refined themselves. Um, what's interesting about the mains type gladius is that you can actually see just a little bit of that leaf shape pattern, right? Uh, so it still kind of curves in and gets bigger at the end. Um, but what's different is that this thing's got a point on it. Let me see if I can like, you see that? That looks, that's a point. So what archaeologists and living history reenactors have, have found is that this point is really good for uh, getting in between chain mail. Uh, you just need to get it past, you know, about here through a chain mail uh, for it to cause some damage. Um, there's a there's another famous type of gladius called the uh, Pompeian gladius, named after the famous city Pompeii, uh, and that is just it's like a flat blade, a rectangular blade. There's no curvature whatsoever, uh, and that would have been um, that would have made the sword a little bit more useful for stabbing. Um, and the main type gladius, which is this type of sword was also used primarily for stabbing. Again, just look at that, that point, right? Um, but one thing that's important to notice is that with the main type gladius, you can still slash because this uh, part of the blade does allow for, if you hit, if you hit right here, it'll still uh, uh, concentrate the force of your blow. And so you'll see some people say that the gladius was um, only a stabbing weapon, but it's not strictly true. Okay. Oh yeah. So the Roman gladius, if we hold up the two swords, I want to do this without chopping my arm off. You know, they look, they look, there's differences, right? You got this cross guard here and you got more of a, a curve here, but they look kind of similar. They look pretty similar, right? Um, but like we talked about with the Ziphos, this was like a backup weapon. Uh, the Gladius uh, here, this was a primary weapon. So the Romans, uh, the kit that they carried into battle uh, included their Gladius, two light spears um, that would actually, when they were thrown, bend and kind of break so they couldn't be thrown back, um, and their shield. And so again, I kind of want to point out how important this shield is to the whole equation, right? So if I just have my sword, I have to do all my defense like that. But if I have my shield, again, I can kind of poke out and poke in, and, right? I don't have to do as much work. And the Roman shield um, was rectangular. Uh, it was bigger than this, what I have, uh, which is closer to the Greek shield. Uh, the Greek shield, by the way, uh, is often called uh, an aspis, um, and the Roman shield uh, is called a scutum. Uh, but there were a couple different types of shields used, right? Uh, there was no mass manufacturing per se, um, just because, you know, can't have a factory in the ancient world. Uh, you can have a lot of people doing the same thing day after day, but there's going to be some irregularities in everyone's kit, right? Uh, especially for the Greeks, um, Greek soldiers who kind of had to buy their own equipment. It was a bit of a pay-to-play uh, thing, ancient warfare. Um, so the Roman gladius, I mean, if we really think about um, weapons that have impacted world history, Roman gladius is ranking up there with like the Kalashnikov, the AK-47 uh, that was used 
uh, by Russian forces uh, in like the Afghanistan war uh, after its invention uh, in the 1950s, I believe. Eh, we're talking about ancient weapons. Anyways, uh, this is the weapon that conquered the Mediterranean world, that built the Roman Empire. Uh, as I mentioned in the later empire, when Rome is relying more on horsemen, um, they actually switched to uh, something called the, um, oh, words escaping me at the moment. It's a spatha. There we go. Sword, spatha. It's been a little bit longer. It's probably about this much longer. Um, rectangular blade. It totally loses this uh, leaf blade shape. Um, but yeah, let's see. Well, I don't have any viewers at the moment, so I can't take any questions, but I will just keep on going until I can run, until I run out of things to say. Uh, well, so we talked about the swords a bit, talked about leaf shaped design, talked about swords being made from bronze uh, and then later iron. So earliest Zippos would have been bronze by the time of the uh, glaze, would be iron. Um, let's see. One thing to note is this scabbard uh, for the Zippos probably isn't that accurate. Um, a lot of uh, sheets for these had a little nub at the bottom so when the soldier was drawing the blade, uh, the scabbard wouldn't get um, pulled up with it. They could actually lock it into their shields and kind of right here it would, it would stick. I could just draw it. Um, Gladys, on the other hand, this is fairly accurate. Uh, some of the more fancy gladii, gladii is the plural, if you, uh, it's like with Latin, um, Fluvius river, fluvi, plural of rivers. Um, the gladii, some of them had really intricate designs here. Uh, Roman soldiers definitely liked to bling out their kits if they were important generals, if they were no, nobility uh, or part of the imperial family, probably had super uh, experienced craftsmen to make them. But uh, I like this one because it's, uh, I think it's walnut wood. Uh, which is a nice rich color, but it still feels like, you know, your, your average common soldier could carry something like this. Um, let's see. Well, I guess it's, it could be useful to talk about what type of armor uh, these swords were being uh, fought against. Um, so the Greek soldiers, let's start with the Zippos again going chronologically. Uh, Greek soldiers would have been fighting against two different types of, of chest plates, primarily. Uh, there's one type of chest plate made out of uh, bronze. Um, it's kind of that, uh, it's got the like abs on it, you know, the like defined pecs, uh, muscle armor, is sometimes what it's kind of casually referred to. Um, so, you know, at that point, it's just kind of like how good's your armor versus how good's your sword, how pointy is it, right? Because they're both going to be made out of bronze, maybe some iron, but, uh, you know, a breastplate's going to do a lot to, to help you from, from a, a stab, especially a slash. I don't think you can get through a, a chest plate with a slash. But again, you know, just to belabor the point, these swords are both stabbing. You can see that, you know, they got those points, right? Boom. Um, okay, so I mentioned that there were two types of armor a Greek soldier could encounter. Uh, oh, can't rest it there. Uh, the other type of armor that a Greek would encounter is something called the linothorax armor, uh, basically meaning in the Greek linen chest plate. Uh, and this is a little bit more tricky in terms of figuring out how strong this would have been, uh, what uh, material even, right? Because it has linen in the name, but uh, you'd be surprised how vague that actually can be. Like how much leather was involved, uh, how much linen, because linen 
uh, it takes a lot longer, a lot more water and resources to, to produce than leather does. Um, but there's been some really good uh, reconstructions. Um, if anyone's interested, I can go find the sources in terms of, of recreating uh, linen thorax using primarily linen. And the way that you do that, or the way that this has been done is by layering linen and then using an animal glue, uh, either rabbit or maybe even horse glue, um, uh, in order to laminate the linen. Um, one second. All right, sorry, distracted by my phone. Um, and it's my belief that um, as effective as linal thorax armor could be, um, especially if you reinforced it with leather or some type of metal plate uh, or scale, uh, it's likely that, uh, that a Zippos, a well-honed Zippos, could probably cause some damage and penetrate uh, linothorax armor. Um, if only because linothorax armor was cheaper to produce than a big bronze chest plate. And so it was more common uh, for a foot soldier to have. Um, that does leave a, a point to mention on... Um, if you weren't rich enough in the ancient world to afford armor, then you didn't get it, right? No one was going to uh, assign it to you or, or give it out. So um, peltasts, uh, people um, who would throw javelins, uh, sling slingers uh, like this, bonus weapon, guys. Didn't even put this in the description. This is a sling. Put a rock in here. <laughs> send it off, uh, you know, could cause someone a pretty bad, bad headache, concussion maybe. Uh, people who were using the sling though, were probably shepherds or, or couldn't afford armor. So, you know, sword versus no armor is, is a pretty good combo for the swordsman. Um, right on, that's the Greek world. Uh, I guess eventually the, the Greeks would fight the Romans. So let's talk about the Roman armor and then we can talk about uh, who the Romans fought. So when the Roman world grew, expanded, and started looking to Greece uh, to conquer, um, the Romans had been primarily using similar tactics to uh, Greece, but that changed and they developed uh, their kind of famous um, legion, as you would see in like a movie, like if you looked at uh, Gladiator or something. Um, famously, even a little bit later than when they would have been fighting Greek, the Greek forces, there's this segment, uh, segmented armor that's like pieces of metal kind of stacked on top of each other. You get the famous uh, uh, head. Oh, I'm running out of steam here. Well, we'll end this. We'll end this soon, but basically, yeah, metal armor, big ass metal helmet. That's the Romans. So this isn't going to be that effective. Now, who were the Romans fighting? Well, the Romans were fighting the Greeks. So the Romans came up against that line of thorax armor, came up against that uh, muscle armor, bronze. Uh, the Romans came up against this oh, helmet. This is a, uh, a Greek helmet. It's, uh, it's another modern replica. Oh, oh, look at that. That's not how they were. Oh, this is called a Corinthian helmet. Uh, it was worn kind of looking like that, right? Ah, but people would rest it on top of their heads like this. This is a pretty famous, famous look, and it, it fits good over my headphones like this. Okay, so uh, Romans fighting Greeks. We've been over that. Uh, the Romans also fought uh, in Gaul, what they called Gaul, what we would call France. Um, they fought fought the uh, uh, the the inhabitants of Gaul, uh, who were famous for actually fighting naked, um, might have painted their bodies blue. That's kind of 
a popular conception uh, war paint. But they fought with these kind of oval shields, uh, uh, some of them with actually similar blades to the, the leaf shape of the Greeks. But they didn't wear any armor. I don't think it served them well. I think that if you're going to go into battle, you should at least wear a breastplate because a shield isn't going to do it for you. Uh, all right. Let me just clock the 20-minute mark. Thank you to my one viewer who tuned in. If you like this video, uh, please like, subscribe, and share. Um, let me know if you want me to talk anything more about um, swords, armor, anything like that. Uh, anything in the ancient world. Uh, I also do art history, uh, that sort of thing. Philosophy, politics, you name it. But anyways, again, my name is Ben. Uh, channel name is The Classics Corner. And thanks for tuning in.